So, logs. That's a nice subject. I can't live with them, can't live without them. And it seems like we have more logs than ever buying for our attention. Sure, you can mine with the LK or Splunk and help you mine those gold nuggets, but when you look at something specifically, it's hard to know what to look for. And what you don't know is keeping you up at night. So, it's nice to you can show us a new way to get more signal and noise from our logs with our machine learning. So, please help me welcome Larry Lancaster, founder and CEO of Stereo. Thanks for, for being here. So this is actually really cool. Um, I've never been to a Bay Lisa event, I think, and kind of understand the organization and the racing are really, really cool. Welcome! <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so I'm Larry Lancaster. I'm the Yeah, it's actually funny. So in 2002, I spoke at the Lisa conference in San Diego, and that's the last time I had to do with Lisa. Is it related? Is it related? Large systems administration and stuff. Okay, cool. So, um, so, so yeah. So this is kind of a deep journey that I'm going to talk about. So hopefully, hopefully some of you will resonate with some of you. Um, some toast in here. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I was just saying it's nice and toasty, so I can take my bald cover off. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so machine data really is kind of my life. Um, you know, my my uh, wife got pregnant, and then I quit grad school in Berkeley, and I was 98, and I came down here and started, uh, after a couple of starter jobs, I ended up at NetApp. And that's where I kind of became, like, Mr. Data, and actually it was Mr. Auto Support. Uh, so they were sending back telemetry from systems in the field, and it was... It was funny because I remember I remember still the interview, and the guy's like, you know, if you made a database out of this stuff, it would be so huge. It might even be like 10 terabytes. It would be unmanageable. Who could deal with that? And it was great. Like it's amazing to see how the, the volumes have, have continued to grow. Um, after that, it was you know, another storage company, and then and then Glassbeam for me was really kind of about trying to like help create database systems um, with sparse definitions of data structures. Um, and then Nimble Storage was basically about grabbing <coughs> telemetry. So it's like log files, but also a lot of stacks that were connected and this sort of stuff. Um, and by this point, we're in the petabytes per year range. Um, and you know, after that, I, it was kind of like, you know, I'm so tired of doing this. Like, I'm really good at it, but I'm really tired of it. Like, it feels like a lot of this just ought to be done happening automatically at this point. So I took like a year and a half off that I really couldn't afford and just kind of tried to build something that would structure logs the way I wanted them structured. Because it's kind of a hard problem, but I didn't want to have to do it manually again. So that's kind of my motivation. <coughs> so the motivation behind Zebra um, is um, kind of comes out of that. So. You know, kind of looking around at how logs are used today, um, <coughs> looking at log monitoring, it's kind of a really manual process. And that has not changed at all. So, so basically what that means is you've got a person who has to kind of set up parsers and scripts to go through the data because, you know, there's no formal grammar for it. Usually there's sometimes structured logging, but guess what? Sometimes that structured logging has a field called message. And in there is like a sentence with a number and a, an interface name in it or something. And so you're, you're right back to where you started. Um, and, and that's kind of related also to the point that um, whoever's using the data for a purpose typically needs to have like a lot of semantic context about the data. They need to really understand what is it talking about. If you don't, if you're looking at logs from a, from a networking device and you don't know anything at all about networking, you're going to be in trouble. Um, and and that's true for any kind of log. So you have a process that has become, it's 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 manual by construction, um, and and so it's hard to scale it. And so when you look at what happens with log monitoring, um, what I see is first of all, um, it's slow to to sort of resolve issues. The thing about logs is. Like for root cause, especially a new issue that we haven't seen before, we're probably going to go to a log file, right? Um, for me, they're the richest source. But 
but sort of, you know, once you do that, now it's a manual process of like, okay, oh, this could be really search for that. Okay, search for that. Okay, get my five VI windows up or let me, you know, it's like, it's kind of like trying to put together a narrative from scratch. And so the more you know about the domain, the better job you'll do. But what if you're, what if you're someone who maybe is kind of like a new DevOps or SRE person and you've got, you're at a company that has a stack that's got 20 components to it, like how much of those details do you, do you really have to know? or even want to know. So, so it feels like sort of the, the solution space and the problem space are diverging a bit. And, and so there's there's some opportunities for improvement. Um, so log monitoring generally is fragile as well. And so so this, I love this example because I'm sure that anyone in this room has worked with logs before. So actually, as a show guy, so like, is who here has actually ever written a script or something that's gonna monitor something or look at a log file for any reason whatsoever, like a regex or anything. Okay, most, okay, thank God, right? So, <laughs> so you're my guys. So, 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 if you think, like, you know what will happen, I've seen happen, it's happened at least half a dozen times to me over the last 20 years, which is like, some developer, like, in, it could be in your company, or it could be someone unrelated to you, but whoever they are, they don't know you, and, you know, a notification, and they'll do something really nice, like fix a spelling mistake. And all of a sudden, some important thing breaks, right? And so that kind of stuff becomes really, so the more you want to build on that, you need to rely on the pieces underneath it, the foundation not to crumble. And so that's a really, and finally, alert fatigue. And, and I think this really stems from just the notion, again, that you're kind of the one, you're hoping that the thing that has the problem in it has, you know, is following sort of syslog, you know, severities and, and that hasn't been stripped off or somehow you know lost in translation and, and maybe you can do something like that but but in general like unless you've got something specifically written for a specific kinds of error you're gonna end up counting things for monitoring like how many errors happen in an hour or you know what, what's my ingest rate from a certain you know container or pod like how many logs am I generating to try to see if something weird's happening so it's kind of a it, it's, it's kind of a tenuous grasp on monitoring, in my opinion. Hmm. So why is it that they aren't better at helping us monitor, given that logs are, are used for root cause? And I think it really does come down to sort of the semantics uh, and the undefinedness of the grammar of logs. I mean, it's just built that way. So this, so this is, I, I mean, I guess I've touched on this sideways, but I feel like I feel like the problem is that we have to treat logs in the mode I've been discussing, we have to treat them as documents. And so we have to index them or come up with clever ways to search them really fast, or both. Uh, but that has limits, and those limits are the person that's doing the searching. That that becomes the problem, that becomes the bottleneck. And I, to me, that, that's like a fundamental bottleneck that I think um, has already been exceeded in many cases. So let's look at that a little in more detail. So 20 years ago, you know, there was a lot of shrink wrap software. Now, of course, it wasn't uh, always sent in a box, but you get the idea, right? There was one user or maybe, you know, a, an account or a group of users. Um, there was like one application, which may have 10 log files, but probably more like three to five that you'd ever really have to look at to know if something's wrong, um, if, some, if there's an incident. And you had a support department. And when that when something went wrong with that software, it's like you it's one, so I'm not saying it's it's not important, but it's one customer in pain that you're dealing with. Um, and so yeah, you're gonna be an expert in that application and you're gonna be able to search through those three to five log types and you're gonna get your answer eventually. And and, and everyone knows support was slow anyway, but it would happen. But now it's become like a real zoo. So you have a situation where, you know, one incident may be tens of thousands of users, um, hundreds of services may be impacted. Um, and then if you think about the different log streams that are being that, that are being brought together out of the infrastructure, you're looking at hundreds of them. Um, and so, but still, someone has to like figure out if it's a new incident that you have not set up a specific monitor or trigger for, and that trigger has not broken, 
but if you haven't done it, you're going to go to logs for root cause. And so, to me, that's something that, that isn't going to work. So, I don't believe that this will last. And so, not only am I sick of it, but I think everyone else is sick of it. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's gotten to the point where, let's try something better. Here, here. So, <laughs> here, here. So, what do I want from a tool? So what I would want, let's just dream for a moment and then we'll get back to reality. So what I would want would be something that would characterize an incident for me before I notice, right? Like, in, so like grab enough data out of the logs. First of all, notice that there's something anomalous. And then grab enough, it's like a small collection of information and present it to me. Um, such that maybe before any alerts are rung, I know something weird's going on that I should look at. That's kind of my dream of how this should work. Um, and then, of course, what I would want beyond that is for that to be, you know, really, like a story to be put around it and all kinds of stuff and, and make it really graphical. But at the bare bones, I want that picked out automatically. I don't want to have to go find it. Right? So the notion being kind of don't have to go and set up parses for all kinds of stuff. Um, just go in and see when something weird happens and bring it to them. Why is it hard? So this is... This is, this is going to be one of those things where, where it's either really obvious or, or it's not, but it's fun to go through the list anyway. So formats changing, we talked about. Ambiguous parses, we talked about. Um, that's just in terms of if a, a person decides to, to, to spend their time building and alerting infrastructure. Um, we talked a little bit about this experts being needed to interpret things, but I think fundamentally there's something that else that's in the way when we kind of push aside sort of the details and look at what people are doing today, which is that apps are bespoke. And what I mean by that is, even if I bring someone in who is like really sharp with all the sort of uh, open source components I've put into my stack and then they get all the, the idea, um, still, for my application, um, there's not going to be a connector for it for some log tool. They're, they're going to have to go in and understand that data. They're going to have to make patterns to, to, to pull that stuff out and maintain that. The fact that apps are bespoke means that things like, you know, everyone has, nowadays there's all kinds of software that has connectors for things like, um, you know, HTTP, HTTP access logs where, you, you know, you'll, you'll, they know how to pluck out the, what, you know, what, how long the request took and what was the response code and what was the, the URL and all that other stuff because that's well known. But that's, that's a very tiny part of the problem space. Um, what about the app that you built? Who's going to know about that? Who will have built a tool for it? And so this is what makes it hard for someone to kind of up-level um, on top of work others have done. There aren't many standards on how to write your applications to log a certain way. You make it up as you go along. Uh, that's right. <coughs> Uh, yes, that's <laughs> 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 so I saw some hands go up. We can talk yeah, any time. We've got plenty of time. You mentioned uh, HTTP, and this uh, has been stuck in my mind the whole time, is that in the early days of web servers, we had this common log format, mm -hmm. and that caught on, and that's general, and that's actually what you're referring to. We know what sort of uh, format we're supposed to see in a common log format. Right? And I'll obstruct me, why isn't there a broader sense of that understanding of, of every log message needs a timestamp, and most do, but the format is different. Why isn't there a standard of, you get this piece of information, this column, this, and then the next column, this, and the next column? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Like, I've noticed the same thing where, so, so uh, for the purpose of the microphone or whatever, I've just, uh, the gentleman, what's your name? I'm sorry? What's your name? Bruce. Bruce was saying, why can't we have, why aren't there common formats for more things than just access logs? I mean, there are some applications that have settled on certain well-known standards, but in general, I think, like, it's even beyond that, because in that case, you know, you know what are the, what are the pieces of data that need to get put into the log? So a very strict format can be written. It's like if you look at syslog, for a generic application even, that's a great example, although there are plenty other sort of packaging standards for log data, but in general, there's a big blob that's called message, and, and that's gonna be a sentence, 
and and since since it's my application, no one could have known what needs to go there. What are the acceptable values and formats for that thing? Because it's it's for my application. I think that's like a fundamental problem that's constraining people. And then there's like there's there's laziness too in the sense that, and it's okay. I mean, because to a developer, this is for root causing. But but you know, people just be like, well, I know if there's a problem here, I'm just gonna dump the entire context tense of this memory map into the log file. Like you get a lot of that, and it's not really logging at all. It's kind of like dumping. It's like a dumping ground so that we have to deal with it. Yeah, it's a zoo. It's a complete zoo. Um, so, so, so I feel like to make this work, we need to kind of pull apart the discrete kinds of events in a, in a log stream without having had the grammar given to us. And we need to do that in a way that kind of works like a human eyeball would do it. And uh, we, I'm going to talk a little more technically later about how we do it and what people are doing today um, in, that are also trying to solve this problem. But the idea is really simple. Pull out kind of what is the structure and pick out the parameters and recognize what's not a parameter and recognize that that kind of tells you what this thing is. It's a type of an event. And then each instance should have a timestamp and all that, hopefully. And then, like for the dumping ground stuff, you kind of got to know, okay, this is just someone dumped a pile of garbage in here that I can't really make an event out of, so I'm just going to, I'm going to put it somewhere else that maybe you can have a link to it as a document. Um, so, like as an example, and this is actually a very nicely structured sort of piece of JSON that still, like if you really want to turn this into the level of structure that I'm talking about, you. You just need to rearrange the parts and stick it in a table, virtually speaking. It doesn't have to be in a database table. But you get the idea that you want, you kind of want, well, so there's, oh, you want to recognize that that's a timestamp. I don't want to have to know, you know, oh, it's, it's some particular ISO timestamp. I want to have sort of a dictionary for those. And for the ones that aren't in the dictionary, I kind of want to be able to say, well, this part always varies between 0 and 59, and so does this, and this is between 0 and 23, so that's probably that's probably time, and, and all of that. So you want to you pull all that stuff out, um, and then this is you know like an integer you want to type. And then over here, you kind of want to say, well, this is, this, is, this is a number with a unit, and it's probably, this is should, a good name for it, right? So, but with an eyeball, this is what you would see. So structurally, you would imagine saying, okay, I'm going to have an errors column, and I'm going to put numbers in there. It's going to be typed in, and I'm going to do all this for this other stuff. Now, of course, this is exceptionally simple. You might imagine that usually this table, virtually speaking, would be hundreds of columns long, or at least dozens, and dozens is common. So that's kind of step one. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I talked about this. I don't really want to have to know too much about any of this a priori because you can't trust that someone will have followed it. That's the challenge, right? Um, and you want to be able to embrace free text logs. Like, like I guess, I guess to me, structured logging makes sense. But the problem is, it like if you think about structured logging, you know, usually what's well structured is this over here. This stuff in here, um, typically in structured logging, you'll have some common fields for a given application, and then you'll have message, and it'll have it might have a sentence in it. So it's also really hard to read when it gets longer than like 50 characters. So you want it to be human readable. So to me, free text log is. Besides, who's going to go back and rewrite what the Linux kernel and everything else? Everything in var log is a free text log. Like, why would I want to go and have to rewrite the whole infrastructure to be able to do my job? So <clears throat> once we've got that level of structure in place, what we want to do then is do anomaly detection on top of it. And the reason you needed to do that was so you could say, oh, this event just happened, and it's happened 100 other times, but this time this number is a lot bigger. Or you might want to say, this is a new event, or one that's very rare. That sort of thing. And the only way you can do that is to have done the structuring in the first place. So it's kind of a, to me, that's a floor we need to lay down. We need to lay down a floor of structure. 
And you might ask, and, I'll, and I can get into it, but like, you might ask, well, how can you do that? What if you only have a couple of examples of a given line? How can you get the correct structure laid down if you don't have enough examples? And that's a very good question. And that's why I think a lot of approaches um, aren't doing as well. I think the answer there is you take your best guess with heuristics, and then as the number of examples of a given event type grows, different parts of the pipeline can add more value. So, for example, yes, sir. Okay, I've got a ton of questions. Okay, <laughs> ton of questions. So let me know when you <coughs> done, like three. Okay. Um, so, as, as you're parsing this, uh, do you need a certain amount of data to actually be useful or accurate as far as your parsing? So, if you've got something that comes in, yeah, I mean, so I've worked with like Mooksoft or I uh, was a big fan of the, the animal monitoring okay. systems. Um, but you know they, they're great with relatively medium or high volume depending on what level your stuff is. Yeah. But if you only have like a stop the wall event, you know, occasionally, yeah. um, they fall apart because there's not enough data for them to right. parse, right? Right, right. And and so do you do you are, do you need anything like that? To, at what level do you need to detect in the model? I mean, can you like get three events in a minute, or three events in an hour, three events in a day, and go? So, so I'm going to show like an example incident later that, that I've called out. And in that particular data set, um, we captured like 80,000 lines of logs yeah. um, across, I don't know, five or six log files. So maybe it was like a few hours it was running. Um, and then, of course, the root cause that came out was a brand new event. Okay. So the answer is you need to be able to handle that. That's right. <clears throat> Because at the, the more rare an event is, the more likely it's going to be important. Okay. And so and so like all the structuring sort of communities like to use something called LCS, which is um, longest common substring, but it's basically a class of algorithms that try to chop up strings and figure out what's what you can bucket with what mm -hmm. based on shared substring lengths. But the problem is with only a few examples, they don't work very well. So you're right. Like there's, there's. It's not just this kind of theoretical stuff that that you need to implement. You need. It's kind of like old school kind of engineering stuff for figuring out how to make it work. How do you bootstrap it from one example to ten, from ten to a hundred, from a hundred to a thousand? Then each one kind of has a different technique that applies better. So as an example, like what we'll do is we'll say, okay. The first thing we'll, we'll do is, unless something comes in and is known as an event, we're going to assume as an event type already. We're going to assume that uh, we're going to assume that if there's like a number, a digit, in a token, and we'll start with common token delimiters like spaces and brackets and all that stuff. Just take the high likelihood approach, and that's probably a variable. It's probably not a constant because it's a number, and maybe later we can be proven wrong and we can change our mind. So the, the point is you need to you need to start with these kind of heuristics and then have a have a, your software basically needs to be able to go back and change its mind and behind the scenes kind of change the event structure on the back end. So that's kind of how we do it. We take our best guess, you put you put your you know, put your line in the sand, say this is gonna be this is what this event type looks like, even though there's only two of them, and then change your mind later and, and go shunt that data into a new event type. So that's kind of our approach. Good question for you, sir. So on that, uh, like drawing a line in the sand, so how do you set a threshold for like anomalousness? Right, so that's gonna come later. So once the okay. structuring is done, let's get that all done first. We're gonna take our best guess at everything. Okay. Sure. And so even if there's like, I only have one example of something, maybe I didn't identify that this thing was a username. Maybe I'm going to assume it's a constant because I only have one example. But later I'll learn it's a parameter. Mm -hmm. right? But so I've taken my best guess. We know it's somewhat wrong. <clears throat> How do you do anomaly detection? So that's a great question. Okay, so let's see. Where have we gone in this so far? We've kind of gone to... Right, so we looked at this slide where we talked about, you know, talking about each event type and, and pulling up where we pick our parameters and put... Typing them and putting them in columns. So we talked about that part, the anomaly detection. So, 
So let's say we've, we've done the structuring part. What we want to do is <clears throat> look for, I'm just going to give you the magic recipe right now, because there's like 80% of the only like good incident detection has really to do a com with a combination of two things. Uh, one is uh, severity and or some like words that are correlated with severity. So if you have all kinds of errors going on in other places as you've gathered more data, you may notice that this word is associated with fatal messages, but other words aren't. So now you can add that to your repertoire of tokens you look for. So basically you start with severity and badness on one axis. And then on the other axis you have rareness. <coughs> Okay. And those, those two things alone are enough to give you kind of the tools you need to do good incident detection. It turns out, and I'm going to show you like a cool chart later of a real incident and, and explain kind of how those things tend, tend to interplay. But it, the, the neat thing that's kind of turning out is that it's like when you've seen enough of these incidents, so, so we've got, gathered at this point well over 100 incidents, from 30 different stacks, from people that have been willing to share their data with us and also the, you know, have come by looking for demos and so on and, and just looking at their, their incidents. And based on that information, uh, it seems that there's fundamental ways that software tends to behave when it breaks. And, and it's, kind of the, it's kind of the way you would go through a lot, set a lot of files with your VI terminal. What would you be looking for? You'd be looking for stuff that looks bad and stuff that you've never seen before. And so really it's funny because the application of those common sense sort of perspectives is what will get you to success. The pro so the problem is that, that those two things alone will get you halfway there, but then it's kind of like, okay, but there's exceptions to that. Like for example, when there's a whole bunch of other new stuff that happened across services, but not enough errors, it was probably a cron job, and blah, 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 blah. So then that's the engineering, and that's a giant living, breathing <coughs> product. But, but the, the fundamentals are, are in those two axes. Um, so once you've done that and you've kind of correlated these anomalies across event channels, right, because now I've got a thousand log streams, I may as well make use of it. Some of them are independent. I know from the tags, if stuff happens at the same time, well, what do we mean by the same time? Well, we need statistical measures across this data set of what the same time means. How close can it be? What's unusual? But if you do that, and now you say, oh, that makes it even more important. It's even more anomalous now. And when we have that kind of co correlation, we create an incident. So that's kind of how, how it works at that level. Um, and, and so an incident, you kind of look for what happened first, and you say, that's probably my root cause, and make an incident report. <coughs> None of this stuff. No connectors, knowledge bases, no information. I don't want you configuring it. And the, and the idea is that it, it works great on, on anybody's app. Um, would it be interesting to the group, I think it might be, to talk a little bit about what other people are doing in the space because we're not the only ones that work on it. Okay, so, so right, so, so there's a, an academic team, there's a few of them. One of them's at Stanford, um, basically, what they do is they use LCS to create event channels, and then they run deep learning on it uh, using autoencoders to try to find weird stuff. And it's, it's pretty cool. It takes too much data. The foundation is LCS. That's that's the to me that's the flaw. It's not what they're doing with the deep learning on top of it. That's the flaw there. In fact, I'm very interested in bringing in more complex AI approaches at this point and putting them on top of what we've got. You know, there's a lot more you can do there to take this set of, oh great, now I've got these 50 events, but it's not telling me a story that fast. I still have to read through them, make sure I understand it. So it's not quite there yet, right? So, so that's kind of the next level of thing that we want to do. Um, another is, yeah, just using one algorithm in general. I mean, so LCS is, actually comes in two flavors, well, three. The, the first one was a batch process, and that was there was a company that did this on log data probably 10 years ago they started um, and they ended up getting acquired they did a decent job but it's very like, you don't get, it's a lot of pipeline building the problem with that in in the context of monitoring is it needs to be 
like this. You can't have had to wait for enough data to accumulate. You can't be running batch processes. The second set of LCS attempts is, is online. It's an online algorithm. Um, and, and it is more efficient, but still it doesn't give you the typing. It doesn't respect the probabilities of, of the tokens you're looking at to figure out where to draw the column boundaries in the string. It's very kludgy and it requires a lot of data. So um, in my opinion, I'm giving you my opinion there, that it's not quite, it's not quite there. Um, and work in batch I talked about. So, question to Larry. Yes, sir. Your two slides back, you are actually training your model. This guy? No, no. This yeah, guy. this guy. You, you, you do the detection on the event type. You are actually categorizing it by training your model based on new events. Or you have, you have, you have, your, your, where, where is your training? Your learning base here would that be under two or three? You know, so so what? I, yeah, so what I'm what I'm or telling you is, it's, sorry, or the continuous. Yeah, it's it's continuous, and, and there's a model behind it, so it's not sort of. A, basically, here's what we pull out of the data. That's probably what you're looking for, because right. the data will train the algorithm. But in what way? What parameters are changed? Mm -hmm. Mostly uh, things about statistics. About if you look at the each event type, mm -hmm. can you imagine. A data point for every point in time that an event type occurs, you have a point process. Statistically speaking, like a Poisson process is, is an right. example of a point process. Mm -hmm. So randomly, every so often, you get a blip, right? Mm -hmm. We know it's not always like that. A lot of a lot of these, in fact, more than half of them will be periodic. So every hour, something runs in cron, or something is outputted to say what time it is, or God knows what. So there's. There's periodic stuff, and then there's kind of more randomish stuff, and there's stuff that's kind of mixed. Right. <clears throat> Regardless, the concept is the same, which is you've got these, what we look at as stochastic point processes, and then you're looking for correlations among them. So you make certain assumptions about those as models, and you refine the parameters of that matrix of processes as you go. So you, you learn better what is, what is reflective of something that is not random, based on the individual channel's behavior. That's what we mean by training. Okay. Right. So the cool thing about um, kind of, yeah, so maybe one more set of details I, I, I should talk about is, um, so we talked about the, how there's the, because I said LCS isn't very good, but I didn't talk about what is very good. So, uh, so yeah, like, we have four stages to the pipeline of, of learning the structure. I'm not talking about the incident detection right now, I'm talking about the structure. So the first step is um, heuristics. If we don't have a match already in the catalog, go to heuristics. The second is, okay, now we've got some stuff that maybe it's in the catalog, but there's only a few examples. And we get another example. Then we go and we look at something we call a reachability cluster, which basically means seeing of how close, how close example these examples are in terms of tokens. Like if you take, if you use a, a basic tokenizer, how close are they? And then things that are closer or not close, we may say, oh, these are closer to this, and these are closer to this. So let's make two types for that. Um, the third is is a, a naive Bayes uh, classifier with a global fitness function, and all that means is that. Uh, across all the different event types, we know how many counts there are. Right? Um, and so uh, it may be the case, as an example, that I would see something with a number and some sentence like, you know, Bob has uh, five eggs, five with a digit. Let's say that's my example. So, you know, now I get another one that says Bob has six eggs. I'm like, okay, great. So that's the same type, but that's a call with, with the number. I don't know Bob's name yet, but that's fine. Now I get another one and it says, June has red eggs. Hmm. So, so at this point, at first, I'll think that's a different, that's a different event type. So I'll say, okay, I'll put that in another bucket. But eventually, let's say I have a thousand that have different names and different colors. But over here, I have only five that have different names they may have overlap with the other seven names. 
and digits. Eventually, I'll say that the cost of keeping this separate from a certain global fitness is, is higher than the benefit of putting them together conceptually. And I'll say this is a string, but sometimes that string takes the form of a number, but semantically it can be a string, and it's the same bet type. So that's the third step. And then the fourth step is, typically that on a big stack will get us down to about, let's say, 3,000 event types. Then the last step is a constant looking over that catalog to say, from an LCS perspective, with all kinds of like weird waiting stuff built in, but still it's LCS, and we, that will prune that 3,000 down to maybe 1,500. And that pretties things up. It does stuff like saying, this is a sentence in the middle of here, which would have, it, it would have evaded any tokenizers we have. And it'll do that kind of prettying up stuff. And so, so all of those, those parts of the pipeline have a different level of effect, depending on how many examples you had. And so, so that's what I meant by, by uh, uh, kind of, you know, doing multiple steps, and, and one of those steps will have the greatest effect depending on how many examples you have. So, respecting Pareto, this gentleman over here already mentioned this, but yeah, if you, like it's funny because in the typical terabyte of log files, uh, less than half of the lines uh, will uh, correspond to event types of which I have more than two or three occurrences. Most of them will be very sparsely represented. And so to your point, yeah, like that, that's critical that you handle those. Um, and finally, with modern stacks, this is great. Taking this stochastic point process approach, not only is more lightweight than something else like deep learning or whatever, but it also, um, it gets better with the more channels you have. Because you have more things to correlate across. It gets tricky as assumptions of independence. So you have to look for constant dependence. So now I'm going to start with something really simple that you can do if you've done this work. So we've structured our events and we've said, oh yeah, this is a number and we were right, it's a number. Uh, and so I'm looking in my log viewer, which you can't really see behind this, there's like a log UI, I'm not here to study a UI tonight. So you could right click on that and get a chart. Why not? It's all in the column. It's like instant. Like there's no scanning through the index to try to find all these things by keyword and pull the number out and all that stuff. So it's quite efficient, but that's not really enough. Let's talk a little bit about what an incident looks like. So this goes back to the things we've already talked about. But like over here, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a moment and slowly walk through this and, re and read, it, read it out so you guys get a, a sense of what's happening. So on the left here, what we have is uh, sort of log names, log types, um, and, and some of these are named for, for the sort of types of containers that we're pulling the stuff out of standard out. Uh, some of them are actually host-mounted logs, like messages. So here you have a whole bunch of different log types, and what you can't see is in between every one of these slots, yeah, there's only one slot for this, but there's like a whole bunch of slots for this. Each one of those is a node. So, so there's multiple nodes in this cluster. And so for each node, you have a, you have an Etsy messages or a bar log messages or whatever, I don't, know, I don't know the architecture. And then you can see some of the Kubernetes types of logs. And then here you can see they're running mini, right? So what's interesting here is, um, so this is minute eight, each one of these is a minute. What we're seeing is on this node for this log type, what are we seeing in that minute? And, I did not put a legend here, so I'm going to tell you. So, so blue means that there were events coming from that log on that node at that minute. Yellow means that there were errors or worse coming from that node in that log in that minute. So that's why these are close together, because they're not mutually exclusive. So there's blue, and the blue is a little higher than the yellow, because there were more total events than there were errors. Uh, the green means a rare event. It's a rare event. 
and the red, which is kind of hid behind the yellow, is both rare and an anchor. So what this is, and oh, and the size lastly means we grouped it into an incident and we, we rang the pager. So you can see that there's kind of a bunch of errors going on, and then there's some new stuff that happens occasionally. But what happens when there's uh, an incident is you'll have typically some new stuff, and then some bad stuff too. And depending on the stack, there could be a lot more bad stuff, and it could go on and on and on. But usually back here at the beginning, you're going to find something that's rare. And this is almost always the case if the problem is log measurable. Meaning, if there's some log event that would tell you what the root cause was. If there isn't, you're out of luck. So this is what a typical incident looks like. And this, this was taken from uh, someone who uh, gave us their data to look at this incident. And it looks like this in the next incident I'm going to show you as well, but I'm not going to walk through these charts. I just wanted to give you a flavor for what's happening visually. So here's an example of an incident, which is completely separate from what we just looked at, where uh, somebody shuts down the, the database, and all hell breaks loose on that last Of course it would. Um, so basically what happens here is, well, I'll show you in the next slide, but you can see here that what we called out is the Postgres stuff. This is kind of in time order. And then some of the stuff blip breaking in the Atlassian components. So this is what it looks like on the page that you go to, but I shouldn't be showing you this because it's bucketed in a probable root cause because these things were rare, but also they, they happened on the same uh, log stream. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them together. Even if this one wasn't rare, it happened right next to it, probably in there. And then here's a bunch of symptoms, and this, this can go on and on. There's all kinds of stuff. <laughs> okay, this is cool. You guys are going to like this. Okay, so, so this is a chaos experiment. So has anyone here like, played with chaos tools, like chaos monkeys? Okay, actually a number of people. Okay, cool. So the idea is like, this, and it's mostly used in Kubernetes where, where it's kind of easier to deploy and fiddle with the infrastructure. But like in general, you want to simulate an, you want to simulate an issue, right? You want to simulate an outage and see what your monitoring would have done. That's the whole point. So, so <laughs> what happened here was, um, you know, so we have a guy who's working in the office who set up, he set up a, a cluster just for testing and he went and ran a chaos test. And unfortunately, it kind of like, I guess it takes the wind out of the sails because it picks up that, that he, so if this is a pod delete test. Basically, the, the chaos runner is going to kill all the pods and see what, what all hell breaks them. So it picks up, hey, the runner is getting a list of pods. It's <laughs> slicing a deletion list. It's selecting a pod to kill. It's well, killing the application pod. Here's the symptoms. Oh crap! Everything blows up, right? So uh, I don't, it's kind of it's <laughs> it's kind of funny. I mean, he was happy with it, you know, as a as a demonstration. But like, but this is I mean, it's actually right when you think about it, right? Like, it, and and it, since that information was in the log, yeah, I mean, it should it should pick it up and put it there, right? So I I like I just get a kick out of this. I just want to show. Store the bullets. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little about where we're at. So, application incidents, Kubernetes incidents. It's so funny. So, some people who are running Kubernetes, they are like, oh, yeah, you know, we own this whole infrastructure. We're very serious about our job. You know, we have N avail and nine's availability goal. We want to see the Kubernetes related stuff. Some people are like, you know, I use Kubernetes, so I don't have to care. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to, Create a bunch of new containers. I'm going to get rid of them when I didn't need to scale down. I do all kinds of stuff. I don't want to have to care about that. So we have to switch, like, turn off Kubernetes incidents just because that's actually that's a thing. And I never would have guessed that there's, there's like, really two kinds of Kubernetes users. Um, and security incidents are interesting. But in general, like, we're not focusing on security. So I don't know. I just think it's cool. 
Like, because you'll see, like, someone will log in, and then they'll do something. And then if something breaks, you'll get an incident. For sure you'll get an incident if something breaks. So it's kind of like, it's probably annoying, actually, if you got fingered. Um, so we had some recent validation. So, um, so my data is um, a really awesome company who does um, kind of Kubernetes cluster management and a bunch of other stuff. They have a bunch of cool projects. Open EBS is one of those. So they took uh, they took the time to actually reproduce a bunch of real world incidents from from clusters that their customers had hit in their environment um, using Litmus, which is also their tool, um, and and we nailed 100 percent of those. So that was actually really exciting for me because it feels like finally after like so now it's been like four years of, from the beginning of starting in the garage to like now it's been four years and finally like like the vision is like coming true, so it's like really exciting for me. Right, so next up, like what, what, what next? So of course we're, we're like improving everything we're doing all the time, but beyond that it's like, what's interesting for me from just the general perspective we're discussing tonight is like, sometimes incidents are not log measurable. They're just not. I mean, CPU is a great example of that. Unless you happen to catch something struggling because it couldn't get enough CPU resources in a log file before all hell broke loose. It's going to be hard to pin that on a CPU spike. And so you need metrics for that. You really do. You're going to need metrics. And those metrics, um, the way I like to think of them as the, is anomalies in those metrics are essentially other points in other processes that I can correlate to things. So I have a spike here, and then I have a bunch of errors here. So conceptually, it's the same concept. But you need that data. And so. So I guess I'm, I'm starting to feel less like Mr. Logfile and more like Mr. Incident, which is good. Like, I'm tired of being Mr. Logfile. That's why I did this in the first place. So this is all good. Um, so that's kind of the next thing that we're working on. And uh, thanks. Here's my contact page. Thank you. Any questions? Anything you want to discuss? Yes, sir. Uh, so if you're doing, if you're converting to Mr. Incident, which is cool, <laughs> like that, um, are you, are you guys t uh, tagging into, are you, are you doing any kind of, or hooking any, is any of your stuff available through API or anything into any kind of incident management tool or platform? Yeah, so right now we have like a generic webhook you can hook up, but we have not done any, it's on the list for the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. We've got a request for pager duty. Right now we're ringing Slack, and we have a sort of a generic web hook, which we could hook up for anything. If, you, if someone wanted, we could do it in an hour. Blameless. Yeah, we're actually doing a joint um, integration with them at the moment. We have a webcast coming up. Blameless.io? Yep. Or like the up and coming you know, incident management platform right. that's been What been is that webinar? That's in about two weeks' time. We're actually having a webinar with Blameless where we chat some conversation. It's pretty cool. So for the microphone, uh, what's your name? My name's Dean. Hey, Dean. Hey. So Dean was saying, uh, what about Blameless? And then Gavin from Zebrium was saying, we're doing a webinar with, with Blameless in two weeks. And so we do want to have integration with Blameless very soon. Like, okay. that's a big thing. Hey, Rob. Hey. Have you guys looked at dumping some small pieces of logs in terms of maybe CPU or other metrics that are hard to find normally into the log files? Or do you want to handle that differently with an external correlation? I, so, so you're saying like, have we looked at potentially instead of collecting the metrics in a raw fashion, having an agent that looks and only sticks them in when they're high or something like that? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, maybe maybe it's top or maybe it's f top, right? And or yeah. h top, and you run it every uh, ten seconds and you dump it out. Oh, dumping that into the log file. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could do that, but it feels like, like I, yeah. So I would, yeah, and I feel the same way because I'm not like I don't mind plumbing stuff out of files, you know. However you dump it, I've done it myself. We've all done it. Had to do it, uh, dumping top out into a log file. Um, but with Prometheus, it's so, my God, it's so easy. You could just it's, pull a Prometheus node operator, right? Or yeah. Something like that, and suck it yeah. that way. Yeah, and it, like, and and most like most of your stack, except for your app. We'll have, you know, like if there's Postgres, you can, same thing. Grab the exporters, 
and put them up, and then and then when when you deploy our collector, it goes and it says to Kubernetes, "Oh, what are you running?" And it says, "Oh, we got metrics for this," and it gets it starts collecting them, and we get we get it. We, uh, yeah, not everybody it. runs a large metrics collection system, right? So that's one aspect. Mm -hmm. And then having ways of figuring out what happened when, if you just have a sparse application or log, right? Mm -hmm. You need to kind of find a different way of bringing mm -hmm. that in. That's a good point. So your idea is something something custom that wouldn't require some big... Maybe if it, it's part of the collection agent that you guys install, right? And that right. can add a little bit more if we did, a little bit mm. more color. Because ultimately, we're doing this because we can't do it in the app. Right? We didn't write the app. Mm -hmm. The logs yeah. are as they are. So right. we need to do something while we're in the log. Like so it. we're doing it in the easiest place we've found to be doing it, which right. is in the aggregated log, right. this log, right? Right. But technically, we can move a little bit closer because there's ways that logs get written. Maybe they're not just open pilot. Maybe there's pipes. Maybe there's other mechanisms where you can get closer to the application, right? catch it sooner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then add these little metrics of, hey, maybe when CPU is double digit or yeah. three digit, mm -hmm. that's when to stick it in, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Versus otherwise, yeah. don't bother. Yeah. So little things like that. I like that. No, that's cool. So uh, one thing I can say about that is, um, so for the ingest part, what we do is we bring the Prometheus metrics home and then we turn them into basically what it would have looked like if you collected them, scraped them directly as text from Prometheus. And so and then we ingest them. So there's like a three-step transformation. to take that intermediate form and then turn that into a bunch of columns and then we load it. So that intermediate form, everyone knows. So if there was like a file that said like CPU, uh, CPU bar, the timestamp, or whatever. It, would, it could just work like, very easily. So we it's should normalize the well. I like this. Yeah, we could just put it on the website. Here's how you would do it. Right. That's cool. So there's a couple other things. Um, the way that you describe using machine learning is, is different than standard approaches, right? And one of the big problems with machine learning is data science. Hmm. Hmm. Because it does so many different things, it munges the data. Right? Mm -hmm. Imagine doing data science on log data. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just horrible. You don't want to do that. Right? Oh man, I gotta tell you this. I gotta tell you this story. So, so uh, yeah. So I went. So in part of like. So after I built the, the, this prototype thing, then uh, you know I went and talked to people I knew and, and got guys together who'd be like a great management team and raise money. But in that process, we just went out and started talking to people and this. So it's this conversation with this guy. You, I'm sure you would know his name, but I don't want to just say it because I haven't like, said anything to him. But um, he works at a big networking company that you'd all recognize their name. And he was like, "Yeah, so he, so now he's like CTO of their services division." And he's like, "Yes, yeah, so we've got this problem. So um, so the the deal is we've got all this log data from all the products that we've ever sold and the companies that we've acquired. We keep it all, so we've got it." And we wanted to understand, like, what's going on in the field? How are people using it? What's the reliability? So uh, what we did was we took all our, our senior engineers, and we bought them all DGX1 workstations, mm -hmm. and we sent them off for deep learning training. And, and then when they came back, we are like, OK, go and learn on the data. And we're going to do big data, data science with your DGX workstation. And after six months, they gave up. Uh, and the reason was because um, that they were spending all their time trying to structure the log data into something that the algorithms could understand, mm -hmm. right? So there, it, it was just that that platform has is the, what has been missing, and I love that you brought it up because it's like saying it in a completely different way. Yeah, understanding is hard. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the things I really appreciate about your technology is that it's more like data science on the fly, without yes. having to do the nasty, dirty data science. Right. That's right? cool. And then the last thing I'm going to say about the interface and the slides is thank you, dark mode. Yeah. <laughs> I love dark mode. It annoys everyone in the office, but I love it. <laughs> I insist. Sir, can we have dark mode on the slide? What's that? I'm more on a curious side when you mentioned the CPU. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, infrastructure itself, right? Is the, yes. 
it drops in the hardware. Yeah. So there's got to be a facility, usually, a heat department or a construction department, who does collect metrics on the hardware side. Yeah, right. Uh, <clears throat> so we're, and if, if it's a hard uh, infrastructure for the hypervisor, the Azure or the Microsoft, there's got to be also tools that monitor that kind of uh, CPU consumption on the VMware resources, right? <clears throat> So in your uh, guess, uh, experience, the data that you are analyzing, you don't have access to those metrics as well from the infrastructure side? So I don't see how it that. Right, oh, so I should have just said how we deploy. We deploy as a fluent collector. Well, there's two things. One is a fluent agent. Well, it's fluent based, it's ours. But it's based on fluid it's on GitHub, they won't look at it. Um, and it's really easy to deploy on Kubernetes. Because we're at that phase where we need it to be like this for people to get on board. That's the only reason we started there. Um, and then uh, for the metrics, we're starting also with what's easiest for Kubernetes, which is here's here's uh, a helm and it's gonna get our it's gonna get our log collector deployed, it's also gonna deploy our own scraper. And we, we made our own scraper for a number of reasons. One, because if you're shipping Prometheus metrics over the network, it's incredibly inefficient if you just did it naively. Um, and plus they drop the timestamps, and there's all kinds of stuff that happens. So, so we kind of rewrote that. We get 1,001 compression over the network. Um, we use all kinds of encoding to, in, in our own binary format to make that happen. But in any case, we, that's all part of that, what gets deployed with a chart. Um, but your your point was, you know, if I if I've already got if they've already got the metrics, can we take it? The other answer to that is we also take. I don't like to talk about it, but we take bundles. We actually have a bundle parser, and it'll, you know how like in the old days you would just say, "Send me a support bundle." Okay, so if you take make a tar file with a bunch of log files, and you could even put like file with metrics dumps in them, we can potentially pull it in from that bundle format. Oh. Can you use pickle format? I think pickle format works. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we've done anything around pickle format. I don't know. I haven't used that since I used that. It's like I some have, visualization I, thing from I have old school, old school, school apps with old school developers. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't think they have to break it apart so we can parse it. Just reach out. I mean, we can figure something out. So. There's probably a shell script that someone in this room could write in 10 minutes that would make it ingestible. <laughs> you show us the commercial side of it. Like commercial side. Like in what sense? Um, Implement that, like, you know, company likes uh, you want to that by your product. What's oh yeah, yeah. So it's a cloud. It's a cloud service. So so basically, you would. So let's say we. I'm just going to talk about Kubernetes. Just but sure. if we have Linux collectors and whatever else. It's just then you have to go configure stuff manually, and it's going to be different for everyone. So we have some of those, um, but so. You know, so yeah, so you'll go get the chart with the player agents, basically. Um, you can just start using it. Like, we just want people to use it at this point. Um, we are gonna we are gonna charge over a certain data volume at some point, but that's all up to the guy in the room. Where is he? Not Jay. So I, what, I, what I would say is, what, is that we're not looking to charge a lot for the service. Um, we wanna be cost competitive, uh, like with, uh, for example, uh, is Log that logging? No, no. Oh, no. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's the one that's just uh, you know, the, the, the elk based players. No, know. the uh, the one that's on Kubernetes that people like. So I like. We looked at um, yeah. Log DNA. Log DNA. Log DNA. Cost competitive with Log DNA. So, so the, the old guys are very expensive. Log DNA. Oh, yeah. God. We're, we're trying to be really open to yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what's so another, another another point. I remember I was in a uh, <clears throat> presentation with Zoho. They were uh, met at their group on the managed engine, and they brought this case where uh, they have data centers in the uh, enterprise, in the, those uh, carnival ships. And it's, it's seriously a data center, you know, and it racks and racks inside of ship. But it has a satellite, and that link is, you know, so so. So they need to, like, they were. Kind of telling how difficult it is to like actually load the you know monitor the uh, 
public when your channel is this much. Oh, yeah. you know? okay. So that's kind of a, a challenge that if you hear soft solution, yeah, so your agents are trying to compress everything as much as possible so it doesn't overwhelm, over, overwhelm it. And, you know, with the, with the metrics, you, you got a lot to work with there in terms of bandwidth reduction. With the logs, it's all going to depend on what they want. Like to be honest, you can, you can get great compression, but it's not going to be a thousand to one. If you're lucky, it might be. If you're lucky, it might be twenty to one. Lucky. So, so they're like for some people who want to run it in their own infrastructure. So we'll put it in their VPC. Uh, so, so we're running in Amazon right now. We're also running in Google Cloud, but we don't. We're not, we're not trying to push people in there. Um, and then yeah, we talk about anything else. Yes, sir. So I have two questions slash comments that are maybe at the opposite end of a spectrum. And the first is one, one thing that, that strikes me about this approach is that is that it, it isn't reading the English the meanings of the English words. It's right. it's making it's learning patterns within the uh, within the log message. Is that correct? Yes. And so does does this imply a certain amount of uh, future proofing that that this algorithm is going to work? Even if we get logs for something I've never seen before, or it's going to work with some software that starts to be written next year. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, so I can tell you, like, people come in, they've got their own app, they want to try it out, they start go to our website, they download the, the little chart. Within a couple minutes, they're sending data, and it, and, and in a couple more minutes, their UI is populated. Everything that's coming has been structured. It continues to work in line. Incidents start happening. Reliably within maybe an hour or less, depends on how much data we like. How if, I'm going to say maybe somewhere there's some the boundaries somewhere between ten and hundred thousand lines where we'll be confident enough in what we're saying to actually generate incidents. Right. On average, but that's different. If there's a thousand generators, then it would be more. You get the idea. On the other end of the spectrum, I am a human being. I do read English, and I do know what uh, what some keywords work. And a lot of my tooling with logs and ball, I'm looking for this word or regular expression or something yeah. and I associate that with something that I already know. Oh, yeah. I also look for things like uh, uh, messages fall within uh, a certain amount of time. You know, if I get yeah. at one of these messages, a series of these messages fall within 60 seconds, yeah. Yeah. I can find a cluster of 48 of these within, you know, nine minutes and I know, ah, something's going on in this period by the proximity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I look for patterns like this as a human being. Yeah. And I wonder, can I use that knowledge? Or another example oh, yeah. is, I know these messages are inert, and I know these messages are important. Can I import my knowledge of what I'm looking for? So I, I don't know what our constraints on time. Gavin's here is like a whiz with the demo on the alert. I could try to bring it up, but let me I can give it to you in a nutshell. <clears throat> like, we have that built really well. So like, as an example, if you say, because it's one thing to anomalously find stuff, okay, but now I found something interesting. I always want to be alerted when that happens, or I want to put conditions around it, or I want it to be more fancy, or it could be something I already know, and it's not coming through an autonomous mind. The way you do that is create an alert rule, and what that ends up meaning to us is, um, you can imagine those tables, right? So it's going to be like something, of the, the event of this type happens, an event of this type happens, followed by an event of this type, or maybe I don't care about the order, but it's best file this. And then you can specify join keys. Has to be on the same node, not the same node. Within five seconds, five of them, so on. Suppress the noise if there's more than n, and that kind of stuff. And you can all the predicates can be formed on the on the columns, and you can relate them to the other events in your signature. So it's it's probably like the most feature complete alert builder that you've ever used without going and writing a script for all of them. Oh, and here's the cool thing about that. So remember earlier I was talking about, so you got an event type, right? And then you say, okay, it's a, now I've got two of them, and I think actually they're a little different, so I'm going to merge this one with that one. So now what happens is that event type, maybe, you know, as an example, if a developer adds a word at the end of the event, or they add one more number, but otherwise everything is the same, we will probably identify that as a variation of the same event type. We'll merge them at some point. If you've created an alert rule on one of those previous event types, we will upgrade the alert to work with the new event type when they're merged. So you don't have to maintain the alerts like you would script. 
which to me is like a big part of the whole point of structuring, right? It's part of what you can get out of it. And I, I didn't talk about any of that tonight because I didn't want to sell you guys a product. I just want to like explain how this stuff works, but I'm really glad you asked. Let's say you're a new customer. Um, do you start learning from scratch, or do you take kind of yeah. previous new models that have learned something and apply it there, and then start from there? Right. So, um, so I would say that, yeah, the only learning that's done is inter-release by me, and I'll say, well, we need to look, we need to add this assumption about how these things are interrelated, or we should weight this higher in general. But when we ship, everyone gets the same rules. There's no cross learning, none of that. My, my goal is to have something that, that capitalizes on the fundamental ways software behaves when it breaks. And I've come to believe that that is not only possible, but we've seen it work. Cool. So, <clears throat> I got two questions. Oh, from opposite ends of the spectrum. Okay. Sure. Um, the first one is simply Zebria. What's the mean? Oh, that's that cool. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's the element, it's the element of pattern. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, and the second is, uh, do you support log files that would be in say multi-byte languages or UTF-8? Uh, so theoretically, we could. I don't think we do right now. Like, I think we chop all the high bytes off because. Right now. Like if a bunch of names come in and they've got like a bunch of Unicode stuff in them, we'll just we'll, we'll shrink them down to a to a we, we do U T F A but we don't do other encodings. Because I mean, at some point, right? If you're just copying yeah. things it's just, that, and, and looking for patterns. That it's just it doesn't on the matter that the word is English or the it word is written in Chinese or Farsi or whatever. If that's a pattern. You're right, it doesn't matter. <coughs> These are all the same, put them in that bucket. These yep. are all the same, put them in this other bucket. Yep, you're absolutely right, it doesn't matter. It'll be fun to try. Yeah, we're going to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you handle logs with transaction IDs and uh, other you know, trace IDs? And oh, yeah, that's a great question. So the good news is you've got that in column somewhere. Some other event type has it in the column, mm -hmm. and you can just join those things or do a union but treat that column as the same thing. Like you can imagine very easy SQL queries that would give you exactly what you want, mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't built any UI on it. There's no UI on it. I know exactly what you're thinking, and I want it too. I want, I want, because that happens all the time. It's usually like a session or a transaction, something like that. And you'll see that little. Right? You'll see it everywhere and you just want to follow. You just yeah. want to follow the, the breadcrumb. I completely hear you. And it's it's yeah, we just haven't built the UI on it. But actually so so here's the thing, we we are looking at opening up the database a bit to allow people to just query it with SQL. Like if you're that kind of guy you can do it, but we're trying not to ask people to do that because mm -hmm. it kind of turns a lot of people off. It's a good question. Who here would be turned off if they were like, Oh yeah, you could do transaction analysis? But guess what? You're going to have to type SQL. Who would find that kind of gross? As opposed to? As opposed to like you have a UI built for you. So you, it's you see, like you see an event, you say, well, that's my, that's my breadcrumb. And we follow it everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly, I would want the UI. I want the UI. But would anyone here find value? Let me put it this way. Would you find value in hitting a database and having a query for it? Or would you rather just get a UI built? If it beats nothing else, then sure, okay. right? And you really, really need that. Like for for my company, I mean, we're trying to implement tracing now. Oh, okay. For all the all all the services and stuff. Oh, cool. And and um, we we bought, we spent a lot of money on another product to do it, but um, if we didn't have a UI for it and could query for it for development work and for you know when when shit hits, hits the fan, yeah. it beats nothing. So the UIs are pretty. That's great, but you don't have it. So that's good. That's good because I kind of feel that way too. I just want to open up the SQL for people to get stuff done that isn't ready in a UI. Whatever it is that they're thinking of, you should be able to just go ahead and query for it. Technically, if you log those, you'll get the bucket of data for what you need to do in the UI. That's right. Yeah. So you can just query it yourself until there's a UI widget for it. Right. 
what does that mean then, that I would need to understand how this whole database or schema looks like? Yeah, so we need to put together the catalog for you, but if you know databases, it's, like generally the, it's named like the constant parts of the message. So yeah. it, it'll be like, you know, that event happened, and then there'll be a column, times, and there'll be an integer. There'll be something like that. I mean, obviously not always that simple, but that's the idea. It's not like some hex value or some checksum or something like that. Because I, I always wanted to be able, like I run like Tableau against it, I run Grafana against it. I do all kinds of stuff to experiment. Like I don't want that to be kind of hidden. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all very much. One brief announcement, make sure you turn in your badge again with security. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for being for good. I think we're still the piece outside. Mm -hmm. Drinks. Mm -hmm. uh, we are speaking for next month. I can't let go right now, but uh, we'll post a meeting about it. Thanks for coming. See you next month. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.